Thanks for letting me uh, round out the workshop with this talk. I'm, it's my pleasure to talk about the architecture and performance of our brand new all flash luster file system, as Julian said. I'm Glenn Lockwood, but I should emphasize that the work I'm presenting is really the product of uh, a, quite a large team of engineers, both at NERSC, which is where I work, and at HPE Cray uh, over the last two and a half years. And so I, I work at NERSC, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, and we are the mission computing facility for the US Department of Energy's Office of Science. And, and so it's our mission to serve, uh, to provide capability computing resources for the entire research community that's funded by the Office of Science. And so we have a very diverse range of science domains that, are, that we support uh, the HPC and data needs of. And this amounts to a very diverse user community. On a typical year, we have on the order of thousands of active users submitting jobs and hundreds of projects and hundreds of different applications. And what's more is they're not just modeling and simulation applications, but they also include large-scale data analysis and a growing component of AI uh, components of, of these workflows. And because we have such a diverse community and diverse requirements, uh, we have to design our systems for this diversity. And so it's not sufficient for us to design our systems to run just one big job that takes up the whole system because although we do support those jobs and about 40% of our cycles do go to very large scale jobs, we have a lot of jobs that rely on us, not for our, our ability to run giant single jobs, but run many small jobs against large data sets. And so we need to optimize really for versatile performance rather than peak performance, because in the context of IO, we're not just doing checkpoint and restart. We're doing all sorts of small incoherent IOs mixed in with uh, very large bulk synchronous. And so from a systems design standpoint, we're now at the point where there's really no reason to be buying hard drives for high performance storage and flash offers the versatility that, that we need from our, our storage systems uh, because it's superior in, in every way to hard drives except for that of uh, cost. So we've been down this path uh, pursuing all flash for a while now. In 2015, we deployed our Cori system and in addition to having a very large disk-based luster file system, uh, 30 petabytes down here, we were also one of the first systems to deploy a, a petabyte or larger all NVMe burst buffer. And this was based on data warp. And so the system is still on the floor today, um, but that's, that's not the system I'm here to talk about. Um, rather, I, I'm happy to introduce Perlmutter, which is our brand new system that uh, we took delivery of earlier this year, and we're currently in the process of standing up. Uh, it debuted on the top 500 this week at number five, and it is a Cray EX supercomputer based around the Cray 200 gigabit slingshot fabric. Uh, at present, we have just over 1500 GPU nodes. Each one of these is four NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Later this year, we'll be fielding about 3,000 CPU-only uh, nodes. Both of these are Milan-based. Um, but, but because we do also serve large-scale data analysis, we also have the system directly connected to the internet uh, with extremely high speed using these Arista routers. And so users can stream data in from external facilities, the cloud, or telescopes or beam lamps directly into our supercomputer at essentially the rate at which we're connected to the internet, uh, which at this point is several hundred gigabits per second. We've also got some gateway nodes that bridge our, our slingshot network to our InfiniBrand storage fabric. And this allows us to mount our high capacity uh, GPFS based disk file system, our center wide file system. But the subject of the rest of this talk is, as I said before, the all NVMe Luster file system that we're deploying with Perlmutter. So at a very high level, as I said, this is a 30 petabyte all NVMe Luster file system. It's 30 petabytes usable. It's built on the Cray cluster store E1000 platform. This 35 petabytes of capacity is spread over 274 Luster object storage servers. We also have 16 metadata servers 
Uh, and if you add up all of the SSDs across the entire system, it's uh, over 3,000 NVMe drives. There's no spinning hard drives in this entire file system whatsoever. It's 100% solid state, uh, no moving parts within the storage components. And contrary to how we've integrated storage systems uh, previously, there's also no LNAT routers in this entire system. And so our storage servers are integrated directly on the same Dragonfly topology, our slingshot fabric, as our GPU and CPU nodes. Um, and this, this allows us to get much higher cross-sectional bandwidth and path diversity between our compute and our storage. Uh, but we chose to segregate the storage into their own Dragonfly groups. And what this allows us to do is get the, the best of both worlds. And so we get really good path diversity between compute and storage, but at the same time, we can power off the entire compute subsystem, but keep the storage and the logins and all the system services up. So it still stays up and accessible to users. Users can log in and get their data during maintenances. And so from that standpoint, it is essentially a standalone file system, but it's directly integrated into the supercomputer. And so physically, this is what a single rack of the ProMotor file system looks like. I took this picture uh, in our data center a few months ago. Yeah, like I said, it's a Cray E1000 platform. And so uh, on the left here is a logical drawing of what the rack layout is. There's approximately 10 of these two U24 units in there. Cray calls them the E1000 chassis. Each one of these uh, two U's has two servers, and then I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, towards the middle of the rack are the are two gateway nodes. These are the things that connect our InfiniBand fabric with our community file system into the ProMotor system. And then at the top of the rack are four 64 port 200 gigabit slingshot uh, NICs or switches rather that are the basis for grouping these into the Dragonfly fabric. Um, so four of these racks comprise a single Dragonfly group. And in Perlmutter, we have four total uh, IO groups in our Dragonfly fabric. And so we have a total of 16 of these racks and they all look roughly the same. Um, and, and each one of these, by virtue of the fact that they are in a Dragonfly uh, topology, each one of these IO groups has dedicated global optical links to every other group in the entire Dragonfly fabric. And so what this means is that every compute node has uh, its own dedicated direct global connection to every single storage group. And so uh, even though they all share the same fabric compute and storage, compute never has to contend with um, storage traffic because they have their own dedicated links across the uh, the global fabric, which is where the, the points of contention can arise. And so if we crack open one of these 2U building blocks that comprise uh, the ProMotor file system inside, we see that they're designed for reliability. They're not, this is not a burst buffer. This is a real scratch file system. And so there's no single points of failure in the entire chassis. Like I said before, there's two servers in each one of these 2U enclosures. Uh, and these servers are either Luster OSSs or MDSs. Uh, there's no single points of failure. So everything's redundant in terms of power supplies, fan, fan controllers, all of that stuff. In the front are 24 U.2 15 terabyte NVMe drives. We're using Samsung PM1733 uh, drives. And they're all dual ported so that every drive uh, is visible to both servers in the enclosure. And then there's also the internal mechanisms that allow us to do heart beating and failover. So if a server pops, it can take over the NVMe drives that were being served by uh, its failed partner and the whole system can stay up even uh, in the face of a failed server. Um, so if we then dive deeper into one of these individual servers, one of the two that's in this 2U building block, um, they are optimized for performance. And so uh, at the center of it is a single socket AMD Rome processor, uh, which gives us 128 lanes of PCIe Gen 4. We went with this design because it allows us to have uh, a completely switchless and non-blocking PCIe subsystem within each one of our OSSs or MDSs. And so we don't need to taper any PCIe bandwidth to get data from our NVMe drives out to the two 200 gigabit slingshot NICs that are in every single one of these uh, E1000 servers. Uh, each server serves up uh, nominally one OST or MDT, uh, and each OST or MDT is composed of 12 of these U.2 NVMe drives. We chose to use grid rate and LDISC FS rather than ZFS because at the time that we had to make this call about two years ago, uh, grid rate and LDISC FS delivered substantially better performance than uh, ZFS did for Luster. And this is a file system designed for performance above really all else. And so there was no point in 
uh, and killing our performance and using ZFS when we knew grid rate would do significantly better. And so our OSTs are standard eight plus two RAID six configurations, but we use do we do use declustered parity, and there's one declustered spare for every group of these twelve NVMe drives. And our MDTs use eleven way uh, RAID ten to optimize for IOPS. And so I said these servers are optimized for performance and they're extremely efficient. And, and we can show that by breaking the server apart into two halves and looking at the RAID subsystem within the server and then the uh, network component of the server. And so we use OBD filter survey, which is a standard luster tool that tests the performance of uh, the RAID layer and, and below. And uh, so it doesn't include the higher levels of the Luster stack. We don't worry about clients. We don't worry about LNAT. We're just looking essentially at, at the RAID subsystem and, and everything that happens within an OST. And when we compare that to what these uh, Samsung NVMe drives are rated to deliver according to the spec sheet that, that we get from Samsung, we see that uh, each one of these um, 12 drive OSTs is capable of delivering well over 90% of the peak spec sheet performance of these NVMe drives. And, uh, and so this tells us that grid rate and LDISC FS are extremely efficient at delivering the, the bandwidth that these drives are capable of. And, and the, our choice to use software RAID, which is grid rate rather than a hardware solution or anything like that, really isn't holding back our, our NVMe performance at the RAID subsystem level. As I said, the other half of each one of these OSSs or MDSs is uh, LNET and the network facing component. And again, Luster comes with a, a standard tool called LNET self-test that allows us to test just the network component of it. And uh, again, looking at performance in terms of efficiency, so the ratio between what line rate or spec sheet performance should be versus what performance we can actually measure off of these. We see that uh, with LNET self-test, we're able to get uh, around 85% of line rate on writes, which is our ingress traffic, and uh, pretty darn close to 100% of line rate on read traffic uh, after you consider um, you know, the, everything that's, that's within the LNET subsystem and up. Um, I should say that these tests were performed uh, with two servers uh, sending data, and then we tested each uh, server individually. And so we were crossing the entire Dragonfly uh, fabric for many of these tests, which is why there's a little bit of spread here, because only one quarter of the, the tests were local to this to one Dragonfly group. Um, but what this tells us is that even though we have two 200 gigabit NICs within each one of our OSSs, uh, the LNET multi-rail feature is effectively able to deliver that performance out. Uh, and our slingshot fabric is also working very well and delivers really solid performance uh, on the network layer and up. And so if we roll all this together and do end-to-end -end IOR testing, um, you know, we, we're looking at the, the Perlmutter compute nodes and uh, an individual Luster OSS. And so um, we're only testing a single OSS in this case uh, because, um, Frankly, we know that we haven't optimized uh, the Luster file system at the point at which we tested this. And we also haven't accepted the file system yet. So we're, we're not really at liberty to talk about full system performance, but we can look at the efficiency of a single OSS or MDS to show that this is a, a really high performance building block for the file system. And so again, you know, doing full end-to-end -end tests between our compute nodes and a single OSS, we get 25, 27 gigabytes per second of writes for a single OSS, 41 gigabytes a second reads. Um, but because this is also flash, we get more than bandwidth. We can also expect a high degree of IOPS. And so the right IOPS, we get 29,000 random uh, 4K writes uh, per second per OSS. And the reads are staggering. We, we can get over 1.4 million read IOPS from a single OSS uh, all the way out over Slingshot to these Luster clients. Uh, and I should point out that this is using uh, Luster 2.12 uh, with a whole bunch of Cray backports. Right. There we go. And so if you take all those numbers I presented of testing the RAID subsystem and the LNET part and then the end to end, you get a complete picture of how efficient our data path is on Perlmutter. And so uh, what this amounts to is, you know, we're getting between 88 and 97% of the raw SSD spec sheet performance delivered all the way out to Luster clients after you take into consideration the fact that we are doing RAID 6 so that every write 
uh, Stripe has an additional two blocks of overhead that have to be written. So it sucks up 20% of our bandwidth, but still uh, we're getting extremely high efficiency from our, our entire luster data path here. The IOPS are, you know, they, they don't look nearly as impressive, but that's, that's to be expected because luster is a, frankly, a pretty thick software stack. And so we lose a lot of the NVMe latency due to the file system and the network, things like that. Um, but still, you know, the numbers are, are, are quite remarkable compared to what we could get with spinning disk. Um, so unless you look at hardware spec sheets all day, like I do, you know, the, the fact that we get 27 gigabytes per second from a single OSS might not mean a whole lot in a vacuum. And so it's helpful to compare it to our previous generation system, Cori, which I presented at the very beginning. Uh, I should say that what I'm presenting here is not an apples to apples comparison. I am kind of cheating here. And so what I did, because we, we do, we, we only tested one Perlmutter server at a time here. Um, I'm normalizing what we're able to get off of the entire Cori file system, uh, normalizing it to the number of servers in each of those file systems. So we get a representation of single server performance for Cori and Perlmutter, um, but the Cori data that I'm presenting uh, because it's normalized down to a single server, has a whole bunch of scaling effects baked in, whereas the Perlmutter uh, data does not. And so the Perlmutter data is, is kind of the top end estimate, assuming perfect scaling, whereas the Cori data is more realistic. That said, I, I believe this is all still within an order of magnitude uh, to be correct. And so after all those disclaimers that, you know, I realize that I'm, I'm kind of cheating here, um, if we look at the read bandwidth per server on a single Perlmutter OSS and compare it to a Cori OSS, which is all hard drive, and a Cori data warp node, which is all NVMe, we see that we can get up to 15 times more read bandwidth out of a single Perlmutter server uh, than we could out of our previous generation uh, Cori systems, individual storage servers. Um, and the read IOPS are, are completely staggering compared to what we were able to get out of even the Cori data warp servers. And this is particularly exciting for us because NERSC as a center, our, our file systems are all very read heavy. And so on any given day, we, we see more bytes read than written to our file systems. And we also think about the read IOPS here as representative of uh, user experience. And so if you think about what what generates tickets about file systems being slow, it's often interactive access. And it's often people logging in and having their logins hang or opening Vim or Emacs and that hangs. And the, and the reason that happens is because they're opening little dot files that happen to be sitting on Lustre. And, the, and that process is just taking a long time because Lustre is busy. Um, and, and that process of reading a bunch of small little pieces from small little files is what hangs things up. And so if you consider read IOPS per server as a metric of how much abuse uh, you can deliver to a single Lustre server before it starts showing signs of fatigue, um, we expect the Perlmutter uh, servers to be able to cope with a lot more abuse from our users in terms of small file accesses and dot files and things like that. And so hopefully it will feel a lot more responsive and we'll get fewer tickets about the file system feeling laggy or, or things like that. Uh, the write story uh, is, is, is also good, but not as good as the read story here. Uh, again, the same caveats apply. This is not a perfect apples to apples comparison here, but the write bandwidth per server on Perlmutter is between five and, and nine times uh, higher than that of an individual Cori uh, storage system server. The write IOPS though on Perlmutter are not as good as what we were able to get on a per server basis uh, as our previous generation burst buffer. And this is because we're paying a pretty steep penalty uh, for resilience here. And so one thing about Data Warp that gives it great IOPS performance is that it's RAID zero. So when you write a file to Data Warp, that file is striped across every single SSD and every single server. But if a single server or a single SSD fails, the entire file system goes down and your job dies. Whereas on Perlmutter, if that failure happens, you won't even notice it because the file system will keep on ticking. And so the difference between this 47,000 write IOPS that we could get on Data Warp versus this 29 that we can get on Perlmutter is the cost we pay for the job, uh, a job not just completely failing if a single SSD happens to pop. It will just keep on trucking. Um, so in the process of standing up the, an all NVMe large scale Lustre file system, we've encountered a few things that we didn't anticipate when we started down this journey. Um, and so the first of, of, of these, these surprises is that we found that read and write bandwidths uh, differ 
And, uh, you know, at some level, that's not too surprising. You would expect that because writes, as I said before, are subject to additional bandwidth overheads due to having to write parity down, whereas reads, the way we run our systems, we don't check parity on reads. So reads get the full bandwidth of all the drives, but writes pay a 20% penalty. But what we're also seeing is that the variation in writes on NVMe is higher than it is for reads. And this is an interesting, it has interesting implications on, on what we want to tell our users about how they should think about striping their data. Because uh, on the one hand, the wider you stripe, the, the better peak bandwidth you get, but also the more likely you are to land on a slow OST or a slow drive because this write variation is so much higher than for reads. And so this is a little statistical analysis that I did uh, in the lower right here that shows that if you have a single um, striped file, there's only about a 7% chance of that file landing on uh, an OST that will give you 90% uh, or less of the peak performance. However, if you stripe over four, five, four OSTs, that probability of hitting a slow uh, OST goes up to 24%. And if you stripe 16 wide, you have a 67% chance of landing on an OST that will deliver only 90% or less of the peak performance. Now I should emphasize that this is not set in stone. This is a point in time when we did these uh, variation measurements and this is gonna change as the drives age, but this is just uh, an interesting balancing point that, that we've not had to tell our users to consider before. This is certainly uh, something that, that users will we'll have to work with our users to figure out the optimal striping. But again, this only applies for writes. For, for read intensive data, uh, the users can stripe as wide as they want and they won't experience the effect of this uh, broad distribution of, of performance variation. The second uh, unexpected surprise that we encountered was that uh, we find that SSD based OSTs tend to slow down with age. And again, this is not super surprising. Uh, hard drive based OSTs do this as well as a result of disk fragmentation. And this is a well understood problem with hard drives. Um, we didn't expect it with flash, uh, but in retrospect, after we observed it, we realized, well, yes, you know, at a certain point you hit this right cliff and the SSDs have so much garbage that every write tends to trigger some amount of garbage collection, which reduces the aggregate performance. Um, and so what, uh, what, HPE has advised us is that they see about a 10% performance drop in write bandwidth after you overwrite the contents of an OST five times. Uh, but unlike hard drives, which take a really long time to defrag, uh, SSDs, you can issue an FS trim uh, through Luster and it restores the drive's performance to like new condition as is as fast as it was on the day it turned on, which is great news because we can now periodically trim to keep the file system operating at peak performance in a way that our hard drive based luster file systems could not. And so we have an idea of how much data our users are going to write per day. And in fact, we use this data to project the capacity we needed for the file system, which I presented at this workshop two years ago. And, and so based on our projections of how much user data will be written on a, on a typical day, uh, we anticipate that we will hit this five full OST overwrites after between 60 and 80 days of, of typical user behavior. And so we plan to schedule a monthly trim just to make sure that the file systems SSD stay in this, this nice uh, fresh state. Um, so I do have a few more fun slides, but I want to leave time for, for Q&A and discussion. So I'll, I'll wrap up here and say that, um, so we're, we're, we're in the process of deploying this 35 petabyte all NVMe file system based on the Cray E1000 platform. Uh, and the combination of Luster, Grid Raid, LDISC FS, Slingshot, and LNet Multirail deliver surprisingly efficient performance uh, from the SSDs all the way out to Luster clients. Um, like I said, you know, what I've presented is only the performance of a single OSS. We have done much larger runs and, uh, you know, I can't disclose the full details because uh, we haven't fully optimized the clients yet. For example, I know that our clients have uh, max RPCs in flight set way too low. Um, and so you know, we don't want to share numbers that we know aren't aren't very good or as good as they could be. But I will say that uh, even our naive tests, the day I got access to the file system, uh, we were among the fastest file systems uh, on the planet. And so I thought it'd be a lot more work to get, you know, super great bandwidth numbers out of this file system, but we just turned it on, mounted it, and you run a big enough IOR job and it goes really, really fast. So it, it's very exciting. 
Uh, we haven't done metadata or DNA testing yet. That's certainly part of our acceptance process and, and we have that scheduled. We just haven't done it yet. And uh, we're in the process of figuring out a lot of the policy related issues that we're going to need to resolve before we let users on the system. We are using PFL, for example, and we're hitting little problems with that. It doesn't seem like PFL has been tested at, at these scales using quite the diversity of workloads that we have at NERSC. So we're, we're having to figure out uh, little, little corner cases that um, HPE Cray has been helping us navigate. Uh, and we, like I said, with this right variation issue, we need to figure out what the optimal striping we wanna advise our users to use should be. And with that, like I said, there's a huge team behind this effort. Uh, and I wish I could acknowledge all of them. And uh, I thank you for your attention this late in the day. Thank you very much, Glenn. So let's see if we have questions from the audience. Just type them in. And while we're waiting for them, I have a question as well. You mentioned uh, that the data warp system on Cori, that it was rate zero. And I wonder about the node failures, right? How often did it actually happen? Or do you have any, do you remember any kind of statistics? How often it was down or there was a problem? I don't have, uh, I, we have that information, but I don't have it at hand. Uh, I will say that unfortunately, uh, I don't want to say half, but a non-trivial amount of the failures that we experience are actually software failures on data warp. It is kind oh. of a homegrown file system. It's got a lot of moving parts. And so we, we have lost SSDs quite infrequently we do lose servers from time to time. They are um, uh, Sandy Bridge servers, so they're pretty old. Uh, and uh, we do experience software failures. And every time we upgrade, you know, there's a new crop of bugs to replace the ones that were fixed and things like that. So it's we don't tell our we tell our users if you want to keep data on there for more than a day, you you should do so at your own risk. So in retrospective now, and seeing the new files in place. Would you agree that this was the best choice you could have made? Or should you have continued with the previous design? Uh, the hybrid burst buffer and disk yes. design? No, I, I'm, I think this is the right design. And so the, we learned a lot from the burst buffer. But one of the surprising things that we didn't expect to learn is that even though it's pretty easy to use, you just add a few extra lines to your Slurm script, the disk file system was kind of good enough and data warp broke just kind of enough that the combination of those two factors meant that users just didn't really want to use it. So our burst buffer is used by a select few power users and they love it. Um, but the majority of our users don't actually use the burst buffer, but we wanted to deliver the performance of the burst buffer combined with the resilience of the disk tier. And, and that's what we did with Perlmutter. So you know, hopefully we made the right decision. It is a relatively cozy file system in terms of capacity. It's only 35 petabytes, but uh, we hope it's a lot more usable to all of our users. I believe so, at least. Uh, I think it's a good choice. Okay, is there any other question from the audience? As we're approaching the end of the talk as well, but... Sure, yeah, this is Jay, I'll ask a question. So Glenn, um, I know Luster is a, um, a common decision. Did you have other file systems that you were considering? And um, if you did, what really brought you to think that Luster was the right choice for this? Why, well, Jay, I just happened to have a whole another section of slides that I could walk through. Um, oh, that'd be perfect. <laughs> this, this answers it, really. Um, you know, why Luster? Because it's boring. Uh, and if yeah. there's one thing that we need to work on the system, it's the storage. And we were already taking a risk by doing all NVMe, which has never been done at this scale before. And so uh, we, you know, in retrospect, we actually have retroactively done analyses and it turns out Luster is, is really good on flash. Um, in terms of bandwidth, you know, the fact that hard drives are, are frankly hard to use and hard to get good performance out of means that any file system that's optimized for hard drives is just gonna do great on, on NVMe without a whole ton of effort. It just, it works really well and Luster works really well. Um, but to their credit, the WAM cloud team and the HPE team that, that contributes to Luster advancements have put a lot of effort into making Luster specifically on NVMe go really well in, in recent versions. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
I know one of the, the differences in hardware between uh, solid state and disk is that um, um, overwrite uh, ends up being um, an erase and a write rather than being a single action. And I think you kind of talked about this in terms of the, the five overwrites and things start to get fragmented and slow. Is that really the only time you kind of see the performance impact? So we haven't- Of having the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, so far, this is the only effect that we've seen. That said, you can see there's a ton of variation in this data. Yeah. And what this was, was I was just running the same IOR job um, for days, just mm -hmm. overwriting and overwriting. And so it's hard to tell, you know, there's a lot of noise in this, but one thing is undeniable is that there is a cliff. And this is the same data that WAM Cloud presented at LUG last year. And this is the same data that HPE told us up front, hey, expect this and we should decide mm -hmm. how you want to address the trim issue. And so hopefully between WAM Cloud, HPE and us, this is the biggest concern we have. Mm -hmm. so, so for your uh, once a month uh, trim, is this something you gotta take the whole system down for, uh, oh. just for system maintenance or? No, fortunately it's, it's a live operation and it can be throttled. So this is very much like the monthly RAID parity check that we do. So we scrub the file system every month. Uh, and so, you know, there probably will be a noticeable effect, you know, jobs won't be able to run at 100% peak bandwidth, they might run at 80 or 50 and we can tune the performance impact of the trim, uh, but it, it's an online operation. Okay, great. All right, I think that was nice and it was really a nice conclusion for our um, workshop to see a really big production system at the end again. And now let's move